going to stick with the theme of AI right now, and we have a super exciting panel of experts just here backstage ready to come on board. Here we have a selection of four different innovators working with AI technologies in completely different spaces. We have one company that has applied it to virtual assistants and scheduling, another company that has applied it to actually supporting legal firms in their due diligence for M&A transactions, another company has actually applied this technology in translation for large enterprises all over the world so they can seamlessly translate conversations or documentations or whatever they need with the power of AI. And then we have another really curious one from here in Madrid that's internationalizing pretty quickly, who's actually looking at building AI that can build out code, right? And actually build out and save in terms of the technical talent that's required to build a lot of these solutions. Um, and all of this is facilitated by a longtime friend of South Summit, Chris Chrysanthus, who's a partner at Notion Capital, Notion Capital, a VC firm based out of London, who specialize in B2B and SaaS solutions and have many, many AI investments as well and are well rehearsed on the space. So the perfect guys to lead the conversation. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Alex Poon, founder of X.AI, Vasco Pedro, founder of Unbabble, Emily Fogg, CEO at Luminous, Jorge Schmurda, founder at Source, and Chris Crisantos, partner at Motion Capital. We're good. Thanks, Liz. Always happy to be here, especially on a sunny couple of days in Madrid. Uh, so Liz did a pretty good job explaining who we've got on the panel today, so I'm not going to go into details on who they are. Instead, I'm going to ask the guys a little bit, um, and Emily, of course, uh, how, did, how did you guys um, come to this world of AI in the sense that sometimes we see a lot of companies that start out of a research uh, program out of a university and then they try to find their market. Um, some of them have a passion about a market and as they're researching into it, they build technology and it ends up, a lot of it ends up being AI. It'll be good to understand your origins of how your company started within this world um, a little bit. And as part of that, talk to us, not going into too much detail, but talk to us a little bit about what the platform does, what the technology does of what you guys have built. And maybe let's start with, uh, with Emily. I'll start in the middle. So yes, yeah, so Luminance really came out, of, came out of the university. So it came out of the research into computers being able to read, being able to read like humans, being able to understand documents like humans, being able to start to play back to you what's in vast quantities of documents. And then really last year, we did work with a lot of work with Slaughter and May, who are one of the leading law firms in London who helped us understand how that was going to be incredibly useful for M&A lawyers, for corporate lawyers doing M&A transactions, to get hold of huge quantities of documentation and instantly see into that and understand what was in there. So it definitely started with the tech, but there's a very, very clear need in the legal sector, which is where we've focused ever since. Right. And, and maybe to touch on that and, and going a little bit into the other guys as well, do you go back and obviously having the techies on the team or the people that did the research uh, mm. within uh, applying it into a sector, does that narrow down their perspective and does that force them to, to freak out a little bit or is it a lot more stay within development and let us deal with the business side while we're trying to figure out what's the right market and what's the right timing for that market? How do you guys... It's very helpful to focus down like that. I mean, this is machine learning. So the more specific you can be on tackling a particular problem, the faster that's going to learn and the better it's going to get. So really, we've been very disciplined for the first year about focusing very specifically on this very interesting problem of M&A lawyers. Too much documentation. You can't possibly read it with humans alone. You're going to need... To you're going to need machines to help you with that. Right. And we've all, as a team, been completely focused on that, focused on that problem. It helps. It helps everyone. Right. Mm -hmm. So if I can interject, uh, for us, it was similar. So we came out of, um, so not specific university, but uh, I have a PhD in computer science, and one of my co-founders also. And so we've always been talking about it. language was our passion for a long mm -hmm. time. And we started with the technology, but very, very soon it was very obvious kind of the applications of you know a better translation layer and right? what you could do in the world and how it would affect companies and how you could get companies to go global earlier uh, but what i found initially is there was a little bit of temptation of letting the you know the engineering part just do engineering but the more there's kind of cross uh, Cross communication, there, and the more they're exposed to the business needs and the business goals, the better they are at coming up with solutions that are oh, useful. Yeah. Right? Otherwise, it's very easy to kind of play in the playground 
let's say, uh, of building technologies for a long time, and then you end up building stuff that's very cool, but it's not really applicable. And because, for example, in our case, in a, and this happens with AI, so it's applicable to so many different things, and translation is like horizontal, and that there's a ton of use cases. It's very important to really try to focus. Uh, otherwise, you know, you will end up with cool stuff, but not necessarily a great company. Yeah, it's really useful. To, it's really important to have that tight feedback loop, I think, where you've got the person who's actually on the end of it you know, feeding I'm directly back into... that's used, right? Yeah. 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 Getting in front of customers. You guys right? kind of <coughs> went through a bit of a transition as well. Yeah, definitely. We, we started out as... Um, so when we started, we, we said, okay, it's, it's very hard to hire uh, developers, right? So what if we would analyze the code of a company or a given team and then analyze the code of the open source code of, of, of the millions of developers who contribute to open source and then see who would match well in a, in a given team, right? So we started with that and then we saw that our technology uh, had actually much uh, further applications uh, than, than just recruitment, right? So, so we ended up then building basically the, the whole stack you would need to do anything that requires AI on code. So analyzing your code through AI uh, to, to do some uh, vulnerability analysis and de detection, uh, code prediction, um, uh, code automated code reviews. Uh, then there's very concrete applications that some companies are building on top of our stack. So we basically went from the application level to the more uh, general level and then working with partners and with clients on building different applications on top right. of it. Right. How about you guys? So, we started very differently. Um, all my co-founders and myself are, have technical backgrounds, um, but the way we think about the world is that if I open up your phone right now, most of your apps demand your attention. Uh, we're in this world of everything, many things are free, therefore everything, the, the currency is, is your attention, it's the time that you spend. Uh, we think technology is going to take save, save us time, but instead, uh, we, we, all the technology that we have on your phone right now is actually taking more of your time. Uh, I personally believe, and then we at XRI, XRI believe that the next wave of technology is about giving you that time back. That we want to build technology that actually save you time, and that's the value that we add. And wanting to do that, um, we, we decided that AI is the path for us to actually implement something that, that allows us to do that. So it's much more about solve, finding the problem first, and then finding that it just happened that the solution was AI. Right. And, and a little bit into our, our subject, um, obviously AI is one of, we, we talked about cyber earlier, and we talked about big data, both very hyped sectors, and now within the AI space, I don't think there is an, an even more AI, a hype sector right now. And six billion plus in funding across startups across the world last year. Uh, corporate spending a lot of money. Um, educate us a little bit because the way you phrase even how your company uh, your company does. A couple of you guys like Ambabel, it's AI powered in a sense. It's not necessarily fully automated. When we had earlier a conversation about what AI is and what in, what different technologies fall under that world. Are you guys fully AI based? Uh, are, are they human plus machine? How do you see that journey? Where are we on that journey? Obviously, AI had a different incarnation a few decades ago, but and yeah. now it's. Yeah, I mean, so for us, for example, um, it's definitely AI plus humans. But one interesting aspect is whether you think about it as humans plus AI or AI plus humans, right? right. So. Actually, when we started, it was very much the idea of how, do, how does AI help humans be able to do much more efficient? Uh, and so it was the machine helping humans. Right. And as we're progressing, what we're seeing for certain use cases, so certain types of content, is that we're starting to revert into uh, humans helping the machine. So our community, we have about 55,000 translators. Uh, and initially, they're very much responsible for delivering the quality to the customer and making sure they know it's professional quality and you know, it's, it's there. But with time, especially with the co content types like chat, they become more of a data generation engine, right? So it's the biggest language data generation engine in the world that enables the machine to learn really quickly, right? And so what we're seeing is in different use cases, you'll have different degrees of is it w w what's driving the process? Is it the right. machine or the human? So the way I think about AI, again, it's such a broad term. Um, there's really three aspects that kind of brought us to the, the excitement that we have today, right? There's, computation power that we have, new algorithms that can take advantage of a lot of data, and then data itself. Uh, at XLI, particularly, one thing that's really important to us is not just a lot of data, but highly accurate, well-labeled data. And for us, in order for us to coordinate meetings uh, over conversation, over natural language with you, 
we need that set of labeled data. And when we first started, actually, it does not exist in the world that this set of well-labeled conversation data specific to meeting scheduling. So we have to create that data. Um, so the way we create the data is mm -hmm. student having humans in the, in the background in the beginning, and then even now at this point, there's some of the tasks that we're still trying to learn and create more labeled data to be very specifically map the, the intention and the separate information that we're trying to capture from the conversation, and then using that to train our model and continue to use the, the, the human and the, the well-labeled data to train the machine. And, and that's a really point. cool point, right? Because a lot of times people think that it's just size of data, right? It's like <coughs> our biggest size wins. And it's true up to a certain point, but a good comparison is, so you look at Google Translate, so Google has a lot of data, right? And what we're seeing is the quality of the data has such an impact, because if you have you know, garbage in, garbage out, if you have a lot of noise, then whatever you train is not gonna be that accurate. And we're seeing internally that you know, our models beat Google, even just at the machine translation level, you know, significantly because our data is better, right? Because the people that produce that data is curated, are curated, so it's very accurate. And the accuracy of data has such a big impact in the quality of the AI you can create. Right. It's really impressive. I, I think regarding the question of if it's AI plus humans or just AI and so on, I think there's always a human at the end of the funnel, right? So you're, it's not like you're building an AI to autonomously exist in the world for itself, right? <laughs> so I think the question um, is... We'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> not, not, not yet, uh, not us, right? Um, but um, I think what you need to figure out is where do humans move, right? So if you're doing stuff that is automating functions that a human is doing, like, like a PA maybe in, in the case of uh, scheduling meetings, what can that person now do um, you know, with being empowered by this uh, to be more productive? So I, I think it's always empowered by, by AI for now, right? Um, How about you guys? I mean, so effectively, you're selling to the person you're potentially replacing down the road. Sure, I mean, y yes, but no, because at the end of the day, we always say that if you see a developer typing, like, during a very extended period of time and, and fast on his keyboard, he's chatting. He's not right. coding, right? right? Because a developer spends most of his time um, actually thinking about uh, what he's going to code. It's, it's more of an intellectual exercise than just typing it down. It's like, it's like a journalist, right, who uh, studies uh, maybe a case or whatever, and then he writes it down, right? This is the writing it down. And that's one of the things where we, where we automate stuff to give them more time to, to do the intellectual exercise. Right. Yeah. And for Luminance, the only human involved is the lawyer, the user, uh, the end user because Luminance blends unsupervised and supervised machine learning. So unsupervised, it'll find patterns in language, any language, it's language agnostic. Um, but actually, the process of putting the label on that happens during the course of an M&A transaction. So the corporate lawyer, as they're analyzing the data, will label the patterns themselves. So accuracy becomes a completely moot point, actually, because it's in, in legal terms, there isn't really any such thing as accuracy. There's right. judgment. Right. So if we were to say this is accurate, then if I'm saying that, somebody else might disagree. So what's important is that you've got real corporate lawyers conducting real M&A transactions, using the unsupervised learning and putting the labels onto those patterns in an intelligent way because they're trained. Um, and then that feeds the learning overall. So we don't have any humans. We're fully automated in the sense that there are no humans at Luminance right. operating the system in that way. But the humans involved are the users. Um, and, and you guys are. Slightly, the majority of you are touching pure straight B2B. Uh, Alex, you guys have a little bit more of a consumer facing mm -hmm. angle to it. Uh, everyone, there, there's a human at the end, obviously, but sure. um, you are selling something that an end user ends up seeing. Where are we? I, I was reading something the other day around, obviously, there's a lot more awareness about AI nowadays, but still, if you look at some of the data, uh, about 40 or so percent of corporates still see it as a, is it really tr truly going to optimize my stuff? Uh, and they're still kind of reluctant to adopt it. Where are you, you guys think are on, on the yes. adoption so cycle? So back to the point of saving time, right? That we, we actually don't market to, to be an AI company. Um, yeah. I like being here, that we're talking about AI. But we, we Your website gives you up. It's <laughs> 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 this is X. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, for, for corporation, for individuals, if we don't add value to you, then it would just be a fad, right? Like you, you, you download it or you use it, and then you, know, you, you, won't, you won't continue to use it. The only reason why you would keep paying us would be that because we add value, right? So I think that the, the core part of that is be, can we, are we able to build a product that we save you time, that you see value in that time that you save, therefore you pay us. Yeah. Right. 
Yeah, I mean, in, in, for example, for us, um, it's uh, customers in the enemy. They like the idea that they're buying something that is progressive and cutting edge, especially if certain companies feel like it's part of their story yeah. and they're kind of, you know, so the fact that it's AI powered and it's the future and here's the trends are going, that's certainly a part of psychologically. But in the end, like the end users for us, for example, one of our biggest use cases is customer service. So, so right now, if you want to do multilingual customer service, you have to hire people that speak those languages or have teams all over the world. What you can do instead is if you use, an, you know, Salesforce or Zendesk, any of those CRMs, you can add the InBevel app to it and then every one of your English speaking agents can provide customer service in 28 languages. Now, for the agents, they don't care if it's AI, right? What they care is, does it actually help me to do my job better? Can I do, does it create capabilities that I didn't have before, right? So suddenly having one person be able to do customer service in 28 languages is something literally you can't do with a normal human, right? Because no one speaks 28 languages. Right. Yeah. So that, that's what they care. You know, the fact that it's AI, it's kind of cool, they're interested, but fundamentally is, does it actually, you know, is there an organ of magnitude uh, increase in capabilities or performance or cost or like something that brings the value? Yeah, it's all about finding what that use case is and communicating the value uh, to the buyer effectively. Yeah, who's and, the, who's yeah. the persona within the and, organization and, and, that you're selling? And for us, it was very interesting because the logical s place to start was in the, a lot of large companies have localization departments that deal with translation. That's the logical place, but actually, they're the ones that feel most threatened because we could actually replace the entire localization department in a company, right? So right. what we found in terms of the beachhead is customer service because localization doesn't do customer service. So you can go straight to the head of, you know, the head of customer service or the, you know, the COO, for example, and then they don't have to go through the localization department. So they can just implement it directly. Uh, with the localization department now, what we're starting to think about and the way we're communicating is this concept of sh shifting left. So. You know, helping like for localization departments, it's not that we're going to replace them; it's going to, we're enabling them to be more strategic, right? So we're going to do right. the stuff that the freelancers do, or, or you know, we're going to help them be more productive, right? And I think if you can get people detractors in the mindset that they're shifting left, everybody wants to be more strategic, right? Oh, you're going to be more strategic. Oh, great! That sounds like now I'm doing something that's more interesting. Uh, that's I think that's having an interesting yeah. resonance. The strategic thing is really interesting for us yeah. because you've got a law, lot of law firms out there who have a, you know, a perception of them, which is that they are long established, very, you know, very, very conservative organizations. And for them to be able to say, actually, we're adopting artificial intelligence in order to boost the value that we give Makes to you as a client is really important. That's when the expectations start to come in, though, because then you suddenly have expectations that, you know, I need to see that it is AI. I need to see, how do I prove that this is really AI? And it's not, and actually, what you really want is a law firm who's saying, I, I've got a problem here. Yeah, I, I need to improve my margins. I don't care. Yeah. yeah, I don't care what you call it. I don't care whether it's a robot or whether it's a, a product that's going to help me work better. I need to be able to improve my margins. I need to survive. I need to compete better. I need to offer more value. And then you get those. You get the people who actually grab hold of the technology and use it, and then they really see the results. Well, it's all a bit conceptual and strategic. You run into a bit of problem yeah. there. I think. I mean, one of the things that I keep telling startups, um, and, and we'll talk a little bit about how you guys are approaching it, because from an open source is a, a whole new different dimension. Yeah. But one of the things I tell startups, whatever technology you're building, at the end of the day, all of technology mm. stacks end up being commoditized at, at some point. Mm. Uh, AI or machine learning algorithms are proprietary, but over time, AWS oh, yeah. and Google and everyone else is gonna... No, it's happening already. So it's, it, exactly. Uh, Google so, is now publish, publishing the algorithms, like the actual models that they're using for doing the machine translation, right, because right. the data is the difference. Yeah. Well, and then, great. I have proprietary data. And I'm like, great, at some point even that gets old. Yeah. So at the end of the day, what it ha has to happen is you have to have the right sales and marketing channels to get to these organizations and speak their language around what's their pain point. How do I solve it? It's less about I've got AI, buy it, or I've got data, no, yeah. buy it. It's the whole end-to-end. -end so what can this do? What can this do for and, you? And in, on that journey, obviously, we've been living the it's AI, it's AI, and everyone wants to play with it, whether it's production or test or deploy a little bit of money. You guys think we are at still early days of, of that adoption level or, or progressing and maybe? In, in our case, we're, the thing is, one, one thing where open source has helped us a lot is that when you say AI, people think about text, people think about images. No one was thinking about code, right? right. And, and still when we talk to companies, most of the companies haven't even thought about applying, haven't even thought about code as a data set. They think of code as a means to get software but they don't see it as a first-class asset that they have that can be analyzed and where you can extract a lot of value from to be able to further um, develop new technologies much, much faster and, much, and, and better, right? 
Um, but by having our technology in open source, uh, the good thing is that you have the adoption from the developer community who are playing around with it, who are creating use cases uh, with this technology that you then can go to these companies and say, hey, look, this is, this is what people have been doing with this. Imagine right. what we can do with your code base, right? Mm -hmm. And that creates the case, right? And even though it's, it's AI on code is a term that two years ago no one was speaking about, now you're, you start to see some companies trying to do some stuff on that. But thanks to having been, been on open source, um, we already have the use cases and have a much easier entry to companies. So you're seeing the adoption get faster and faster in a sense. I mean, obviously, sales cycles within enterprise, and I can't even begin to imagine within legal firms mm -hmm. how, how it must be. But yeah. are you seeing the right response to it? It's all over the map. Okay. It, changes dramatically from region to region from so firm it's geographic to firm. Is completely yeah okay. some firms will just grab this and adopt it across the whole firm and uh, start to see the value straight away um, others will feel like they've got to have lots of committees and decision making about you know is this the right thing to do before they actually get to the point of rollout right it really depends I mean in a lot of ways actually it gives the smaller firms an advantage because they can adopt something across the whole firm very quickly so we've had a lot of success in Scandinavia and um, in the APAC region because the firms there tend to be tighter and they can say right this is how we're going to do everything now um, and they can achieve that whereas a very very big firm obviously you have to start within one practice area and then they learn from each other. Um, but the great thing is, I mean, a little bit like you, you know, you, you pay for what you use. So actually, you can, we can land and expand there. Right. You, you start with one practice area, and then the others will notice what's going on and start to pick it up. So it happens quite organically. I think it's a little bit ironic that, in a way, we're all using AI already. I mean, maybe course, email, yeah. you know, spam detectors. I mean, there's, yeah. like, school search, uh, right? I mean, yeah. image search. Like, yeah. we're using it on daily uh, lives. But at the same time, there's a little bit that's starting, I think, will be in the next three years, a little bit of sat saturation of the AI term, right? So it's, mm. it's so pervasive. We're all doing AI, but I think AI is really successful when it stops being talked about and it's just embedded in the things that you get, yes. right? So you'll talk about, like, oh, like, here's how you, you know, do M&A acquisitions. That's how you search a lot of data, you know? And it's not about AI, and, and then everybody will use it, right? Once it's out of our minds, and I think part of it is because, you know, even defining what AI is complicated, you know, versus machine learning, versus as soon as you get there, it's no longer AI, right? It's like, oh, you know, search used to be like, you know, top AI stuff when, when Google was starting, and now it's like, it's just search, it's not AI, right? So this is happening continuously. Rule-based systems used to be the thing, right, in the, in the 70s. Yeah, I remember those days. Yeah. I'm old <laughs> enough. <laughs> um, it may be kind of a tangential thought on, um, on adoption within the, the employee base. Obviously, People want to work for cool companies, and uh, AI companies are, are typically considered quite cool. You guys are all over the world. We have everything from New York, Lisbon, uh, Chicago, the motherland of Cambridge, in, in terms yeah. of the development team, effectively, yeah. and, and the local one here. How are you guys seeing sourcing talent, keeping talent, uh, especially in smaller ecosystems uh, potentially. In AI? Yeah. Yes. Like specifically? Yeah, I, I, on, you know, on the development team, less on the sales yeah, and marketing. I, I, specifically on AI, I can tell you that the one thing that you know, we've been doing and it's working, and I've, I've been looking a lot at this, and I think it has a big impact, is the ability to publish. So we bet this in the beginning, because you know, two of the founders had PGs, and we're kind of used to it. And what we feel is it attracts much better talent. So when people, in AI specifically, people that have PhDs, and kind of when they feel that whatever they can do, that there will be a way to publish. Uh, they One, it's weird because other people will see the work that you're doing, right? So they'll read some of the papers, like, oh, these guys are actually doing real things. It's not hype AI, it's like, I can see what they're doing, it's cutting edge, et cetera. And the other is then people feel like they're not going to a dark hole, they're, they're still part of the community. And I think that being part of the community and evolving and being exposed and being right. recognized is super important. You guys must see that a lot, no? Yeah, I mean, we, we, everything we do is open source. So everything, and then everything we released is, has, um, some type of post or something a where, yeah, yeah. Where, we, where we explain it and so on. And I think that is key. And the thing is, it might seem as, okay, you're exposing yourself and your technology too much, but it actually protects you because we don't have our development team working on our tech. We have our development team plus the whole development community, which in terms of man hours working on that tech is a fucking lot. Right? Mm -hmm. um, so that means that when a company says, okay, let's, let's build our own stack of AI on code, it doesn't make any sense to do that right. because the community is developing our tech as well as we are in a speed that they can't achieve and then it's, it's not worth it so they just implement our technology. So you have a global employee base. Yeah, and we don't pay them. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. So we take it 
opposite approach. <laughs> uh, we publish almost nothing. It's hours. <laughs> yes, it's all hours. Um, I mean, I think there's also a difference too. Like our application is very much leveraging the, the domain, right? Like us knowing that it is meeting coordination, meeting scheduling, we can outperform um, any else open, open source software out there, so on and so forth. Um, so a lot of the development that we do are very specific to our problem. Like we, we're trying to so again, we're trying to add value to our customer. We're trying to solve a problem. We want our team to add and have impact. And and the impact a lot of time comes from yeah, building things that are very specific for our our problems, yeah. and which they don't lend very well into open sourcing. Uh, we, we we don't really work on. Or we don't contribute to TensorFlow, or right. like we don't do any of those things. Yeah, we, we we actually we modify things to, to tailor or take advantage of all the all the edges we can get from the domain. Yeah, and we're similar to you, I think. Yeah, we do have the. Yeah, the, well, did you say motherland of Cambridge? There was that what you said? <laughs> okay. um, yeah. So we no, are in I Cambridge, which be, means yeah. you know that we're in an environment where there's huge amounts of revolutionary thinking going on, and people want to be there for that reason. But also, we've built a platform which is really scalable, um, and which, you know, in its core, is amazing. So actually, when we change it, we change it as little as possible. So if a new use case comes along, and we have a client who says, you know, I really want to be able to do the following. Things here, we change it as little as possible to make that pos to make that work for them, right. so that we're not developing this kind of big sprawling mass. We keep it very very tight, and that's very satisfying for the team. I think they can really see, you know, as that's sort of finessing over time. Yeah, I think also. I mean, but this is generally with startups. I mean, people nowadays more and more like to feel that they have agency, right? So that they're doing meaningful work, that they can see what's going on, that, you know, we're 65 people now, so we're not massive, right? Uh, so we're still at that stage where I know everybody in the company, you know, like I can talk to everybody. And, and people like the feeling that they kind of know where they're headed. We're, we have internally, we're not that transparent on the outside, but inside we have, we're very, very transparent with everybody in the company. So even things like uh, P&Ls or like, you know, like just high level information of the company, unless there's a clear reason why we shouldn't divulge, we're like very transparent with everybody. And it helps them feel like they're really part of the journey, not just yeah. the work that they're doing, but of the organization and, you know, yeah. and, and team. I stayed up right. all night coding yeah. that. Did anyone care? And actually, if they then see that you know, somebody's closed a huge deal on the back of that yeah. little change that they made that they thought, like to your point, thought very hard about it and then made a very small change, um, then that's what matters. Cool. Well. I was planning on having questions from the crowd, but we're running out of time. Um, AI is not going to take over yet. We still have some humans involved in yeah. the process. So thanks for uh, sitting in and listening to the, the great panel we had. Thanks, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.